Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and thanks for tuning in to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where I do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige, Fat Feminist Witch, broadcasting to you today from sunny southwestern Ontario. So today I am talking all about chakras, where they're from, what they are, what they do, and of course, why you should even care. <laughs> I'll also be reviewing Chakras Plain and Simple by Sasha Fenton, and I've got a great new sketchy herb and magic rock for you at the end of the show. This is going to be a great episode for all of you who are new to spiritual practice or meditation, or maybe who haven't updated their spiritual practice in a little while. Hi friends, I am so happy to finally be talking to you again. April was like a wild month here, and a lot of my boring, like real life type stuff really got in the way of everything else. (laughs) I also had some pretty serious construction and destruction in my ordinarily very quiet neighborhood. (laughs) The house right next to me is being torn down, and uh, one guy came and tore down the whole top half, all by himself, all by hand. It was unreal, but I don't know how that was actually louder than if a machine had done it. So I just, I couldn't get to any recording, unfortunately. Uh, Also, some of the real stuff that I had to deal with in in April was really important. And it's, it's part of my overall journey towards better mental health. I recently finished another treatment program just a few weeks ago. Yay. And I have a bunch of paperwork to figure out and a whole bunch of new stuff to to send in. I have to start a new treatment program soon. All month I was filling out paperwork, uh, thinking about my day-to-day life and not really spiritual stuff. And of course I was filing taxes because being an adult is terrible. And then I took a lot of naps outside of that. (laughs) Uh, A lot of times when you're going through an illness, even one that's not necessarily physical, like the depression or anxiety, It can be kind of hard to find the time and drive to engage in spiritual life. It can kind of just feel like it's not important right now or that it just takes a little too much emotional effort. So it can be really difficult. Uh, And honestly, when your world and your life kind of feel like a dead end anyways, opening that up to even more stuff like past lives or other planes of existence or talking to ghosts, it can just kind of feel like too much stuff. But near the end of the month, I found myself super, super frustrated with how non-magical my days and weeks and everything had been lately. And I thought back to my New Year's episode that I put out at the beginning of 2017. It's one of the few episodes that I've actually gone back and listened to of my own. And I just, it's wild. I sound like a totally, uh, different person. But it's really interesting because I decided back then to open my mind up a little bit to some of the things that I've categorized as new age spirituality, like meditation, yoga, uh, Eastern religions, energy healing, and the law of attraction, and trying to fit them into my very like (laughs) retro 90s style witchcraft practice that that was born out of Wicca. I've always been more of a, a I don't want to say a traditional witch because I'm really not, but more of a classical style witchcraft. You know, I love to carve candles and burn herbs and listen to Stevie Nicks. Uh, And I found myself kind of rejecting the idea of chakras for a really long time because it just, again, it just seemed like this whole extra thing that I just didn't need. But over the past couple years, I mean, not only have the concept of chakras become more and more popular. Everyone and their mother uh, is talking about chakras and spiritual circles now. So I I couldn't avoid it anymore. I had to learn things about it. Um, I rejected it for a long time, but over the past couple years, I've been so attracted to this idea that I honestly can't even imagine going back and thinking that I'm not interested in chakras or that I don't need to use that whole idea and system. So... If you've heard the word chakra like a million times, but have no idea what that means, that is totally okay. Even if you've been a witch for 20 years, it totally happens. I've mentioned this quite a few times. The world of witchcraft and new age spirituality used to be very, very separate. You had your new agey people that were into Kabbalah and yoga and listening to CDs of chanting and and chakras. And then you also had, you know, witches and pagans and all of that other thing that were more into Halloween (laughs) and casting spells and worshiping the moon. 
that has all really blended together now. There are tons of new agey witches out there and vice versa. It's all, we've all come together finally. I love it. All the psychics and, and witches and yogis are just, we all love each other now. So, <laughs> so there is more of a push to learn about some of this stuff. So if you're a little bit new to it, that is totally okay. I'm going to talk about some of the basics of chakras, which I've gotten out of Chakras Plain and Simple which I really, really liked, very much recommend, and gave a 5 out of 5 crystal ball uh, review to on my blog at fatfeministwitch.com, which you guys can check out as soon as you're listening to this episode. It will already be out. <laughs> so something that I really, really like uh, about chakra, something that really drew me to it, is that working with and being aware of my chakras, these energy points, is something that I can do even during those times when I'm feeling cut off from the spiritual world or the universe or whatever it is, because those chakras are mine. They're inside me. I don't have to go searching anywhere. I don't need any tools and I don't even have to move. <laughs> I don't have to move to work with my chakras, but mostly it's that it doesn't matter that I'm cut off because those chakras are in here. I'm not cut off from those. I can always access that. And that's something I can always do. So I really liked that. I really liked that there is this whole system, this organizational <laughs> color-coded system to categorize some of the energies that I work with. Um, I've never really liked to work with health or wellness-related magic or spells. I just never have in my life. And I'm not exactly sure why, but I wonder if some of it is because, first of all, I was young enough back when I got into witchcraft that I thought I was invincible, as all young people do, <laughs> or because the word health also came with its crappy little friend weight loss that I, I ha still have a real aversion to. A lot of magic and spirituality related to health can also seem really fat phobic and inaccessible to those of us who don't have, you know, that rock and superhero bod. Not that I'm knocking the rock and superhero bod. If you worked hard and got yourself all jacked up, I respect that. I really respect that. But I also don't always feel that respect coming back at me. So health kind of seemed, it sounds so weird, but health in general just seemed kind of unattainable to me. But I just, I need to work on my own health now. Physical, spiritual, all of it. You know, I'm, I'm getting older now. I'm, I'm in my 30s, for those who don't know. And your health just changes. I'm not saying, oh my God, I'm old. But your health and your body and your mind, everything really starts to change as you get older. This is a really different phase of life. And I've noticed that I've let a lot of my health, uh, you know, fall into disrepair. And some of that is spiritual health in addition to my mental health, obviously. But this is something that I love about chakras is that I factor them right into my spiritual health along with my overall care for myself, they really bridge that gap between the self-care you do in a physical way, you know, taking care of your body and the stuff you do in a mental, emotional, spiritual way to take care of yourself, like working through issues or clearing your energy or whatever. So chakras are very easy to understand once you find a good source, which is why I liked this book so much. It was very short and concise and easy to read. So easy. Um, Wiser Books puts out a bunch of these books in the Plain and Simple series. They're short books that give you a really nice overview of whatever the topic is. And they're popular topics uh, like chakras. I have a Wicca one. I have feng shui, fairies, color therapy, Reiki, meditation, reincarnation. I mean, there's just a million things, although there's not one about auras. So if you are from Wiser Books <laughs> or if you're a writer and need to pitch an idea to somebody, I want a book like this about auras, aura energy, aura fields, reading auras, the color of auras, all of that. I want it. So, you know, just in case you're listening. Um, <laughs> but uh, chakras I actually ordered because I have been learning more and more about chakras and I wanted a really good little reference book that gave me an overview of all of these, the main ones especially, um, so that I could start working with it on my own. And so this was a really nice concise guide. <laughs> I don't work for Wiser and I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just saying it's good. So it's easy for me to understand with a good guide and it's a really nice, organized, 
rainbow color coded system to check in with yourself, mind, body, and soul, to find out what you need to work on and what you've been doing right, and to access different parts of your personality and your life and your, your spirit. So for example, when I first started learning about my chakras, I assumed that some of my lower chakras, which control sexuality and sexual energy, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, were all gunked up. <laughs> I thought this because, as I've mentioned before, I had been celibate for a while and I just didn't, I wasn't interested in having sex with anybody. And I would even go so, so far as to say I was afraid to get into any sort of sexual, sexual situations with any people at all. So I assumed that those lower sexual chakras had some issues going on when I started learning about how they work. But I had multiple energy workers and other people that work with chakras tell me that those chakras are running just fine and that there's no issues there. So I kind of started to think, well, if that's the truth, where is the real root of that problem actually coming from? Is it from one of these other chakras? And they told me to check them out, <laughs> find out more about the chakras. Uh, Learn about what it's like when they're running good or when they're running poorly or, you know, tap into some of that. And I actually found that I understood my own problems so much more and where they were coming from and the kinds of effects that they had on me. I've made a lot of strides in some of my emotional issues by working with this chakra system, this really nicely organized system with tons of colors. I'm a very visual nerd and I love that stuff. So I won't, I, I wouldn't say that I'm like, I'm cured. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. Thanks to my chakras, all my problems are gone. But I would actually no longer even go so far to say that I am celibate. I think it's true that I was celibate and now I'm not celibate. I'm just, you know, I'm just single and spend a lot of time alone. It's not like my problems are gone, but I've really chipped away at that. And I, I didn't realize how much the chakra system had really helped me with that until I took stock of how far that I've come. And now when I have a friend who practices Reiki or some other energy work that includes chakras, check mine out. Uh, different chakras <laughs> are doing differently than they were before. And some stuff that was bad before has been healed. And some stuff that was good is just, you know, needs a, a new update, a new boost. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you're probably pretty confused. I bet you are. So let's remedy that. Let's fix your confusion here. Let's find out what these chakras are all about. So what actually are chakras? <laughs> This is an important question. So chakra is actually a Sanskrit word uh, from India, meaning circle or wheel. So right away, that gives you a little indication of, of kind of what the chakras can look like in your visualizations. So the chakras in our body are these very subtle energy vortexes. They're all throughout your body and they are the way that our life force or our prana moves in and out and through us. They're often pictured, you know, in a straight line with a tube of light kind of, kind of running along the length of your spine and connecting all of your chakras there. Like they all pool into this one kind of tube of light. Um, in Chakras Plain and Simple, Sasha Fenton says, imagine a length of pipe running through your body from head to toe. And along its length are seven cones that resemble the open ends of trombones sticking out the front and back of the body. Now imagine that the cones are spinning. So that probably gives you a better idea of how they both take in energy and, and spit energy out. So <laughs> whenever we use energy, we're bringing it in from all of the sources around us. And then when you're expelling energy, it's got to come from somewhere. When you're casting a spell, you usually build up energy through spiritual work. And then when you cast the spell, you release the energy. So already this makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, the chakras also relate to our five like physical senses, our sense of touch and sight and smell and hearing, as well as our intuitive and spiritual senses. So they work with our aura, uh, our auric field that's all around us to take stock of our environment and, and help us adapt our energy or our interaction with the world at that moment and in that place. And this is kind of why that difficult emotional issues or trauma can affect your chakras even after that 
has finished. So much like how our brains will hide trauma for our protection, you know, they hide memories, uh, or they'll use trauma to influence how you act and think in the future. Like if, if you uh, go through the same issue all of the time, you'll start to instinctually avoid that issue. So just like that, your chakras change a little when you experience things, whether they're positive or negative. And that's not to say that your chakras are like permanently ruined if you've been ill or have gone through something difficult. Um, just like anything else, I mean, you can go through trauma and illness and still be a fully functioning human, human and your chakras can do the same. They just need a little attention and care, just like anything else. So today we're going to focus on the seven major chakras, the ones that run the length of your spine from tailbone up to the crown of your head. There are actually around 78,000 chakras in our body, according to this book. In addition to these seven major ones, you have 21 minor chakras, 49 tiny chakras, and the rest of that 78,000 are minute little micro chakras. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> I had no idea there were more than seven until... I had a pranic healing session. This pranic healer was really cool and answered all of my questions. Uh, pranic healing, by the way, prana is our life force. Pranic healing is healing our life force. Uh, she told me all about these teeny tiny little baby vortexes all over your body. So your elbows, your knees, your ankles. If you have a physical issue, sometimes she can find that in one of your teeny, teeny, tiny little chakras in your knees or something. Really, really cool. Uh, they're kind of like... They're like magical pores. <laughs> they, they take in stuff from around you. They get stuff out of you. And sometimes they can get clogged. <laughs> and then you don't look so good. So some of them aren't even actually like right in your body or energy field. There's one that's down below the earth that kind of anchors you called your earth star chakra. And then there's some above your head that connect you to, you know, the celestial world and spirit and magic. Chakras, for those who don't know, are from India. The first mention of the word chakra first appeared in the Vedas, one of the oldest spiritual texts in the whole world. Uh, Hinduism is, is based on these Vedic texts, and they're considered by those who practice Hinduism to not even be human in origin. They're, you know, a gift from the spiritual world. The chakras, as we kind of know them, originally came from India, but spread all the way throughout Asia by way of, you know, Buddhism, Jainism, Chinese, Taoism, and other uh, spiritual faiths in that area. Uh, chakras became part of our Western lexicon in the 1930s, thanks to, and I'm not even kidding, famous psychoanalyst and psychiatrist Carl Jung. I'm sure you've heard of Carl Jung before. If you've ever, ever taken any sort of class or had a conversation that is about the history of psychiatry, you have probably heard of Carl Jung. If you've heard of Freud, you probably heard of Jung. So Jung was an incredibly open and spiritual dude in addition to being a doctor of psychiatry. Uh, after years of treating his patients, and I'm sure he turned his psychoanalytic eye on himself, Jung became convinced that a connection to spirituality was essential to a healthy and happy life. He was a total pantheist, and honestly, I'd call him a pagan, though not to his face. But he, he was a open man who studied lots and lots of different spiritualities and became convinced that when you don't have that spiritual connection, it can cause real problems that we see in our lives. His ideas were not actually that far off from a lot of the other spiritual people from around his time that are popular in witchcraft, like, like Aleister Crowley and even the, the first Wiccans and Gerald Gardner. He believed a lot of the same things as they did. He, he was just a little bit more legit. He's written a ton of books about chakras and about Kundalini energy, which is another uh, term he's responsible for bringing to the West. Um, so he believed that spiritual healing was essential in your journey to even physical wellness. He even kind of indirectly uh, is responsible for the philosophy of Alcoholics Anonymous, which encourages you to include a spiritual belief in your journey to wellness. The people who ended up forming Alcoholics Anonymous were students of Carl Jung. They attended workshops and, and talks and they talked to Jung and that's where this philosophy. Um, something I thought that was really, really interesting while I was researching this is that Jung's theories that state that not including spirituality 
in your journey towards self-realization can cause neurotic symptoms like depression, phobias, and psychosis. This is really neat because the type of depression that I was diagnosed with last year is called persistent depressive disorder. But once upon a time, it was just known as neurosis. You were just neurotic. Again, that's probably another old word that you've heard before. And the hallmark of this is people who are plagued by like an existential dread and a crisis of faith. So that kind of was a sign to me that I'm really on the right track about learning about chakras and it could only do me some good. So let's talk about our chakras, our seven major chakras. There are seven majors throughout your body. These are the largest in your body and control multiple functions, each that are all related. Some are physical, some are mental, and some are spiritual and instinctual. So if you like, while I'm talking here, go onto your computer, into your search engine, and look up chakras or chakra positions or chakra chart to find tons of really nice little visual guides. It can show you where they're located while you follow along here. So your first chakra is called your root chakra. It's, it's the seat of your most primal instincts like survival and sex. Your root chakra is located right at the base of the spine, like literally when you're sitting, it's the pelvic floor. So <laughs> it's associated with the color red, the planet Mars, the zodiac sign of Scorpio, and the earth element. So those who are already witchy practitioners might already have a little idea of what the root chakra is about just on that little explanation. It's a very energetic chakra, but also very grounding and instinctual. This is your instinct right here. If your root chakra is in good alignment and it's nice and it's open, you will feel confident, stable, and have good common sense and probably even a good sense for money. It's also in charge of fun stuff like your music, dancing, and rhythm, and the pleasure you get from physical activity like dancing or even playing sports and having sex. When your chakras are out of balance, there can either be, you know, just a little too much of that chakra energy coming out or maybe too much. <laughs> If someone is greedy and work obsessed, but not for reasons like passion or purpose, they just they just need more money. If they're selfish and materialistic, and I quote from the book, cruel, racist, bigoted, bitchy, and nasty, they might have a little too much root chakra going on. This chakra is also the one that concerns addictive behaviors and conditions. Which is, again, very interesting because many addictions actually come out of trauma and pain. You know, there's a hole in there that needs filling and substances or sex. Do that in a way that makes us feel good. We have an unstable foundation and it's hurting us and we are trying to soothe ourselves with substances. So working with your root chakra or some of the issues related to it can have a really positive spiritual effect on that issue if you are having trouble overcoming something like that. If someone's root chakra is weak or blocked, they'll probably be really flighty. You know, they're not down to earth. They don't have that sensible connection and they have no real sense of realism. Uh, and those neuroses will come out hard and can cause stuff like depression and anxiety and severe phobias. I know, that one's sad. <laughs> so that one is probably real out of whack now, even though it was okay before, <laughs> in me anyways. Uh, next is your sacral chakra which controls your ability to accept and take pleasure in other people and new experiences. It's located right in the middle of your, your abdomen, like just below your belly button. <laughs> belly button. So this chakra is also related to your sexual and reproductive organs. It's associated with the color orange, the moon, the element of water, and the zodiac sign of cancer. The sacral chakra is also an instinctual chakra, like your root, but it also factors in emotions. So fun fact, sacral chakra is actually the largest in your body. It's the biggest one you have. And that's because it controls those emotions and it also kind of controls everything in that area. So if you get nervous and maybe have to run to the bathroom before a speaking engagement or before a really important date, or maybe you get that really strong icky butterflies feeling in your stomach, that's your sacral chakra. And it has a big effect on how we feel and, and how we interact with the world. Uh, the hallmark of a really strong and open sacral chakra is knowing what's best for yourself and knowing when someone or something is hurting you and knowing that for sure. That sounds kind of simple, but it's actually like much harder than it sounds. It's hard for a lot of people 
to know that someone is hurting them and to do something about it. It's really hard. Um, if you know someone who is uh, fair and a fun parent, they're everyone's friend, they're someone who's easy for most people to get along with, has a good sense of self-esteem without the ego, their sacral chakra is no doubt in really good condition. The chakra also works with your sexuality and the pleasure you derive from intimacy versus the physical pleasure you derive from sex specifically. And of course, your passion and creativity. A supercharged sacral chakra can lead you to not understand the concept of moderation. Chocoholics and winos, take note there. <laughs> These people thrive on drama and they don't really care how it affects the people involved. They're, oh my God, these are the soap opera people. They can also be really jealous and have some really sad abandonment issues. Uh, when the chakra is weak or clogged, that person will be the opposite. They'll retreat from other people. They'll abandon loving relationships with people by focusing on something like work or something else that's more mundane instead because they, they can't deal with that intimacy or that level of emotion. It really just makes you makes it very, very hard for you to relate to other people. Next up is our solar plexus. This is the seat of your self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-worth. Do you see a little trend there? I bet you do. It's right above your belly button and it's associated with the color yellow. It's very sunny. Uh, the element of fire, the sun, and the zodiac sign of Leo. So your solar plexus chakra controls your ability to achieve your dreams. Uh, it controls your curiosity and your desire to learn and your happiness and contentment. The chakra is all about the relationship we have with ourselves. You know, self-worth, self-confidence. It's the first of our very emotional chakras. And when it's working properly, it allows us to be happy and successful, have energy and willpower, confidence, courage, and it helps us to be open to gathering new experiences. If you have too much solar plexus, it can leave someone feeling cold, logical, and too analytical. Very super literal, argumentative, and aggressive folks might really have a little too much solar plexus going on. When it's blocked or it's closed up, it can be hard for you to attain success or really do anything of value. You might still have dreams or goals, but you can't get there. You can't make it happen and you have no willpower to actually try. It can also make you kind of a people pleaser and just unable to advocate for your own wants or needs. You can't make things happen for yourself, but you can make them for other people. That one's rough. It's <laughs> it's hard to know when you go from being nice to being a pushover. When you go from being someone who's very friendly and takes care of their friends to knowing when you are putting your friends constantly above yourself. That is a really hard skill. There's lots of balance involved there. Next up is our heart chakra, and I'll give you three guesses as to where it's located. <laughs> Uh, it controls your ability to love and to find inner peace. It's associated with green or sometimes pink, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, it's associated with the element of air, the planet Venus, and the zodiac sign of Libra. Lots of love in there. So the heart chakra controls your ability to love others, to love yourself. It controls wisdom, selflessness, compassion, devotion, and even your self-care. Those with a strong and open heart chakra are loving and unselfish. They love to be loved. They're willing to forgive themselves and love themselves again. And they have a really healthy ability to cope with pain or trauma or difficulty. Too much heart chakra can cause you to put your own needs above others, hold grudges, or even develop a little bit of a murder complex where you always, always, always have to be the one that suffers the most. If you're always treating people like a project to be fixed, you gotta dial down that heart chakra a little bit. Just bring it on down. Those with too little heart chakra naturally are a little bit more self-pitying and dependent on others to the point of manipulation. It can also cause you to lose interest in romance or love like entirely. You're just, you just totally let go of that because you're closed off. I feel like in general, we all go through a tiny little heart chakra shutdown, like after we deal with something like a breakup or a divorce, or 
losing a friend, you know, we, we block it out. We don't want to have a new relationship just now. We don't want to be open to love. We want to be closed off and into ourselves before we can open back up. You're healing. That's what that is. The heart chakra is very much associated with overall healing. The fifth chakra is the throat chakra. Again, you guessed it. It's right here in our throats. <laughs> the chakra rules communication and self-expression. It's associated with sky blue, the elements of both air and ether or spirit, uh, the planet Mercury and the sign of Virgo. The throat chakra is all about your ability to communicate, your use of language, your ability to learn from others and to listen to their point of view. It's the first of our mental chakras and it's also associated with logic and reason. Spiritually speaking, your throat chakra serves as a kind of a gatekeeper between your lower chakras, which are concerned with the physical world and humanity, and your more celestial upper chakras, the ones that are more concerned with spirit and magic. So someone with a strong throat chakra is authoritative, they have good instincts that they actually follow, and they love to debate, but are not aggressive or argumentative with it. They set goals, they take personal responsibility, and they're independent. They're good at negotiating and they're not afraid to speak up for themselves and their needs or to act when they see injustice against others. If the throat is too active of a chakra, it can make you share your opinions like incessantly without stopping to listen to the perspectives of others. I've dubbed this the Fox News effect, and honestly, no one wants that. No one wants a Fox Newsian throat chakra. <laughs> These people are loud, they're bullies, and they can be intolerant and spew hateful garbage. If your throat is closed, you'll have trouble speaking up for yourself, have a real affinity, and maybe even an addiction to lying, and can generally just be kind of a pessimist. They're always willing to point out what's going wrong. If you're psychic, if you have psychic abilities, your throat chakra also rules clear audience, which is the psychic ability to hear messages from spirits or divinity or, you know, whatever. If you find that ability is waning, you may have something wrong with your throat chakra. Next up is everyone's favorite, certainly my favorite. It is the third eye chakra. It's the cool one. <laughs> so some place our third eye right between our actual physical eyes, while some place it more in the middle of our forehead. I genuinely imagine an eye there with a kind of like dark purpley blue iris. Did you guys ever see The Witches, the movie with Angelica Houston? Witches all have purple eyes, right? <laughs> I've always thought of that. So it's associated with the color indigo blue. And I learned this from Rainbow Bright as a child because indigo was my favorite color kid. Indigo blue is a very, it's a dark blue, but it has a lot of purple in it. So if you see the third eye associated with a nice dark purple, that's not necessarily wrong. There's just not enough blue in that purple. Got to get out your paint mixing skills here. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's associated with the element of uh, ether or spirit, the planet Jupiter, and the sign of Pisces. This chakra is concerned with your connection to the spiritual world, to magic, and to psychic energy. It rules things like your psychic senses or your ESP, channeling and mediumship and clairvoyance. It also rules self-knowledge and vision, like the ability to be a visionary here in the mundane world. Your third eye opens up anytime you meditate, practice magic, or do divination, and probably while you're dreaming if your dreams have a little bit of a psychic flair. People with a strong and open third eye are no doubt psychic readers, or they have the remarkable ability to bring their inventions and ideas to life. All of these crazy things they imagine actually become real. There's this theme with the third eye of pathways, and these people can find their way through absolutely anything. They can see right through an issue to the very end. They have vision. If the third eye is a little too active, you can be judgmental, out of control, rude, and just like full of excuses for your own bad behavior. If you can't have a conversation with other people without denigrating whatever they believe in or talking about how great you are, you might have a little bit of a third eye issue. Also, if you are 
only talking about spiritual topics all the time. You're bragging about your psychic abilities. You've become obsessed with wacky conspiracy theories. Your third eye is no doubt in need of some TLC. You're getting boring. (laughs) You're taking something fun like magic and turning it into such a bore. Stop that. So finally, we come to our seventh chakra, our most magical of our chakras right here in our body. It is the crown. The crown is located, you know, at the top of the head and a little near the back. Uh, Something really interesting in chakras, plain and simple, that Sasha Fenton pointed out is that when babies are baptized, the priest will often close up that chakra with holy water and, and brush it during the ceremony. Uh, lots of followers and clergy from a lot of religions, like Abrahamic faiths, they also wear yarmulkes, caps, or scarves over their crown. It's said that covering the crown chakra contains that energy and allows you to focus more through your third eye and keeps you from, spiritually speaking, you know, floating away. <laughs> I thought that was really, really cool. Um, the chakra is a little hard to explain. But this is your direct connection to spirituality, magic, and the world of spirits. So the crown is, again, the pathway your soul takes to exit your body on the way to the afterlife, and the crown facilitates entry to your Akashic records. It symbolizes faith and trust and an interconnectedness with everything in the universe. A strong crown chakra presents itself through you as optimism, joy, peace of mind, and the ability to feel hopeful about your future. So clergy people, those who dedicate their life to selfless pursuits, and those who seem to have one foot in our world and one foot in the world of spirit or magic, they often have a strong and open crown chakra. If the crown is too strong, it inhibits the ability to function in the real world. Spirituality and religion, they work best when integrated into your actual life. You've got to use them to actually still live in our world. That's the real message here with all of these chakras. You pull spiritual energy down through your crown, but that energy still needs to reach your instinctual chakras down below if you're to be in proper balance. So a superiority complex, especially with spiritual topics, can be an indication of too much crown, that you're not using it effectively to bring that energy down into your real life. And of course, a weak or closed crown cuts you off from your concepts of spirituality, hope, faith, and any feeling that you have a higher purpose. Your life is kind of, it's nothing. You you wake up in the morning, you go to work, you make money, you come home, you spend money on groceries, you go to sleep and you die. You know, it's, <laughs> you have no, no other reasons to live, but the things you can see and touch with your own senses. So those are your main chakras. As I said, there are way too many for me to list them all. And some of them are not even within your body. But how interesting is all of that? How interesting is that when you can see personality traits and issues and things like that through this spiritual way? It's also really cool because you can focus on specific chakras. So if you are having a lot of trouble with communication lately, you can focus on your throat chakra and you can use things that are, you know, they fit in with the color or the sign or the energy of that throat chakra and help heal it and get it working in proper order. Now, this might mean doing some spiritual work with it, or maybe you have to do something like uh, therapy or counseling. Maybe you need to learn a new language. Maybe you need to get better at your own language, or maybe you need to find other ways of expressing yourself. You know, maybe you are always doing a lot of talking and the way you talk you don't get your point across properly. Maybe it's time for you to try writing things out or putting those feelings into a song. Find a different way to express yourself. So the chakras are very, very interesting. Very interesting. And once you break it down, they're a little bit more easy to understand, I hope. Uh, (laughs) So almost all of that information that I just unloaded on you guys Um, The stuff about Carl Jung was my own research. I got really, I fell into a rabbit hole, you know, the Wikipedia rabbit hole. I started looking up Carl Jung's spirituality and I just, hours later, I came up for air. But most of that came out of Chakras Plain and Simple by Sasha Fenton. Like I said, I gave it a five out of crystal ball, uh, five out of five crystal ball rating on my blog because it was so, so easy for me to understand and so easy for me to go back and use this book as a reference all the time. Like it's, this is another one of those books that 
I haven't had very long and it's already falling apart. So the book starts off with a lot of what I've talked about, some of the general in, uh, information about chakras, how they work, where they come from, some of their history. And then it has a separate chapter for each one of your chakras. It tells you all of that information I did and then a little bit more. And at the beginning, it also has this really handy chart that gives you all the like, all the correspondences of that chakra. So, you know, the first chakra is the root chakra. It's red, central concept, survival and life, um, <laughs> health connection, legs and base of the body. It even gives you a mantra, a sense, a gland, uh, music that works best with that chakra and uh, an affirmation to work with to heal it and exercises to heal and check in on each individual chakra. It's really, really cool. So if you want to uh, read the full review, you can find it on my blog at fatfeministwitch.com. So how do you actually use chakra energy in witchcraft? This all really sounds like some, uh, you know, psychological work rather than witchy work. But there are actually a lot of ways where I find that chakra energy really is already kind of built into my witchcraft. For example, in a really easy example is color. Each chakra is uh, associated with a different color and the way those colors work really lines up with the way colors work in magic. For example, red is very uh, passionate and it's very fiery and, you know, light blue is very much for communication and peace and purple is a very magical, magical color. So I found that working with the chakras, I can use that as sort of a, a theme to theme my, my spells and rituals around. I love dividing my energy or my spell work into these chakra organization system. So whenever I'm doing work um, to increase psychic abilities, to clear out uh, any sort of psychic entities or spirits, and when I'm just trying to connect a little bit more, I will often use the third eye and crown chakra imagery, um, symbols, associated flowers or crystals, which in chakras, plain and simple, she gives you great lists for each chakra of associated crystals, flowers, herbs, essential oils, all of that kind of thing. I gather that stuff up and I focus on that chakra and I feel like I just stay on focus a little bit more and I feel a little bit more convinced that my magic has gone out there and gone to the place that I needed to and that it's out there working for all of my purposes. So in that way, chakras are already, they already have a great place to fit in to witchcraft. I also think that there is something really, really interesting about the idea that that energy is already in here. It's already in here. It's always moving. It's always swirling. It's always growing and changing. And again, I really like the idea of energy and magic coming from within myself rather than from somewhere outside. Now you use some of your upper chakras, like your crown, to pull spiritual energy in, but your crown is still always working and swirling whether you're consciously pulling that energy down or not, because you are energy and you're already working with this kind of stuff. Um, I've talked before about magical fashion and about daily correspondences. Sometimes when I feel like a particular chakra is lacking, I will actually use that kind of magic to help work it out. I'll wear a crystal still. <laughs> I'll try to wear a crystal or make up a perfume that I know works great with those chakras. I'll even try to seek out some food. So with my throat chakra, you know, I'll be going out and getting myself some blueberries and some other really nice blue foods, <laughs> smelling some blue flowers. Um, and I'll try to just concentrate on the energy that's laid out in that chakra's description. I recently made a poppet that was to help me communicate more effectively about my own issues, advocate for myself, and talk about my health. And when I made my poppet, I chose blue and I chose uh, symbols and stones and herbs that are associated with that chakra as well as that type of magical energy. It just combined so perfectly. And I feel like it's actually been uh, working really well. <laughs> I hope so anyways. So factoring your chakras into your magic is not difficult. You just have to have um, 
a basic understanding of how they work and how yours specifically work. I really like the idea of doing a meditation where you go in and you examine your chakras to figure out your own strengths and weaknesses and things to work on. And that can really influence your magic. For example, if you find you have a really super strong third eye chakra, psychic energy work is going to be your greatest success right there. That's the best kind of magic for you to work with. Uh, Then again, if you have a really, really weak root chakra, maybe it's time for you to start working with more earthy energy and focusing on more of those primal or instinctual spells. And let's say that's the case. You got to incorporate a little bit more root chakra into your magical practice to help get that muscle moving, basically. But the spell you need to do right now is for love, something that is very flighty and exciting and heart chakra-y. But that's not what you need. You need something stable and grounding. So you can adapt your spell to incorporate more earthy elements and to work more on finding um, a stable relationship or making your own feelings for love and commitment be a little bit more stable and grounded and to help you be a little bit more realistic about your actual, the actual things that you want and tap in to what you need from love on a more primal and instinctual level. From there, the spell that you create, even if it doesn't mention your chakras or anything, will just be better suited to what you actually need. Isn't that interesting? I think that's really cool. So that is what I have for you for chakras. Now we're going to move on to the final segment of the show, which is the sketchy herbs and magic rock segment, where we will be talking about lilac and fire and ice quartz. Today's sketchy herb and magic rock are all about working with your chakra system and opening a doorway for you to access magic and metaphysical knowledge. Lilacs and fire and ice quartz are the ones we're going to be talking about today. So lilacs are in bloom right now in my neighborhood, in my part of the world, And the scent is literally intoxicating. It's beautiful. I can smell all throughout the neighborhood. Fire and ice quartz is this beautiful, clear piece of quartz that's full of cracks and fissures that reflect these rainbow mirrors. And you can turn it around and see it in all different lights. It's one I recently got at my local crystal shop, which is called White Feather Holistic Arts in Windsor, Ontario. And it was a new crystal that they had just gotten. And as soon as I walked in, it was like gravitated right to it. It's beautiful. So let's start with lilac. Uh, Lilac, it's associated with the element of water. It works with all of your chakras. Uh, It's aligned with the planet Venus and it's used for protection, energy clearing, chakra balancing and clearing, uh, magical power, walking between the worlds, peace, psychic abilities, romance and love, (gasps) summoning and communicating with spirits and letting go of the past. Lilac is an incredible magical ally with a lot of uses. So have you ever gone outside at twilight on a warm day while the lilacs are in bloom? It feels almost like dangerous, like you're walking someplace that you should kind of be wary of. It's the kind of smell that really makes you believe in magic and spirits and fairies, even if just while you're smelling it. It's intoxicating, and I'd follow that smell right over a cliff if you caught me during that kind of magical in-between time. I love it. The energy of lilac is just like that. It's transcendent and it's otherworldly. It's beautiful and romantic, sleepy and serene, and even a little bit spooky. Love spooky. So lilacs are one of your best magical allies when it comes to opening, clearing, and balancing all of your chakras. Even just smelling lilacs in bloom can be enough to make you feel like you're perfectly balanced between earth and the world of magic. You're rooted here, but not cut off from there. It's associated with all of your chakras for this reason. You can find lilac sprays and incenses, but sweeping your aura and your um, the areas of your chakras with fresh cut lilacs is truly like the coolest way to clear and balance your chakras and clean up your aura or energy field. Honestly, just cut off a nice piece and brush it downward from the top of your crown all the way down until you feel more cleansed and balanced and grounded. So 
You can include lilac fragrance in anything you do involving meditation and spirit work. When your chakras are open, they enable you to both receive and project energy like I talked about and magic a little bit better. Using lilac in your rituals can help you uh, more easily move between the worlds or rem realms and can help you facilitate you know, a deeper connection when you're meditating or sleeping. It's really good for psychic dreams and it, it, it's a very sleepy smell that's very calming uh, or spell casting, obviously. Fresh lilac blossoms can also be used to call in positive spirits to you and it can also help you exercise scary entities from your home or your space. Uh, in The Magic of Flowers by Tess Whitehurst, which is the featured book this month in my private witch and bitch group, she says she uses lilac as a exorcism tool, basically. Uh, she uses fresh lilacs, white candles to help guide any spirits or entities that are in your area towards wherever it is that they need to go in the afterlife. So isn't that interesting? You, I never would have thought of lilacs as something to use to work with ghosts, but it's an incredibly, but of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. It's such a spooky and magical type flower. Um, and of course, it's also very lovely and it's very fragrant and it's very springy. So it's incredibly romantic. And I don't mean like really fun groping in the car after a burger date romance. I mean like whirlwind, dizzying, crazy, you know, nights on white horses kind of love. So the love for the ages kind of love, you know, the big stuff. The stuff that's kind of wild. Maybe it doesn't last, but... It's a really good time. So include dried lilac. Uh, you can collect them now and you can hang them to dry. Or if you can find lilac oil, you can work that into your spells, use it to dress your candles. You can make a lilac perfume and you can even get lilac essence to add to a bottle of wine or like a cute little ice cream cone or maybe some chocolate. Uh, flower essences, for those who don't know, are a lot like a uh, gem elixir. These do not contain any actual plant or, in the case of gems, uh, rock material. It's the essence or the vibration of the, the lilac, in this case, distilled in water. So if you're sensitive to smells and perfumes, um, or if you have trouble finding real lilac oil, because the fake ones can be kind of irritating, essences are a really cool way to work with flowers if the scent is just not really appropriate for what you're doing, or if it's the middle of winter and there's no lilacs anywhere. So flower essences are kind of an interesting way to work with well, flowers specifically, but these essences are more, these are for people who can feel energy. If you were, wanna work on feeling energy and feeling the energy of lilac, even if you can't access them, you can take flower essences, you can drink them in a glass of water or put them under your tongue, or you can work with them in your spells and rituals. It's really cool. Um, so as I said, use your lavender to clear your chakras, to get you into a meditative sp space. It also opens up your third eye and your crown. All of your very mystical chakras are uh, enhanced <laughs> by the magic of lilac. And then set it there to help you reach a deeper meditative connection or to help you open a circle to call in the quarters or positive spirits. You can put it in mojo bags, put it in your spells. You can add it in for almost any kind of spell that needs a magical and psychic boost. And you can use it to cleanse your space, of course. You can bring it all over your house, uh, bringing lilacs into the home, put one little vase of lilacs in every room, open up the windows and just wait for that smell to fill it up. Beautiful, just so beautiful. Um, if you want to learn more about the magic of lilacs, I got a lot of this from Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs by Scott Cunningham. The Magic of Flowers, both the book and the Oracle deck. I really like the Oracle deck. I have the card sitting right here as inspiration, and it's very magical and mystical. I also use the Flowerpedia by Sherilyn Darcy, which is brand new. And my own wonderful experiences with uh, <laughs> hanging out... <laughs> at twilight underneath the lilacs and watching all of the bats and spooky cats come out to play. It's fun. You can find uh, this entry with the sketchy herb and 
this magic rock on my blog, of course. So our magic rock is fire and ice quartz. I put pictures on the blog so you can see what I'm talking about. On first glance, it looks kind of just like a clear quartz that's been busted up on the inside. <laughs> and some people might think, well, what's the point? But when you look at it, you see that all of these different little cracks and ridges create prisms of color, just bright rainbows, and it reflects the light in all of these wacky ways. And in every single, it, it, it looks different in every kind of light, in every kind of environment, in every kind of direction. It's really, really interesting. And most of them are, are either cut or, you know, harvested in a point shape. So they're really good for helping you direct your energy. Fire and Ice Quartz works with all of your chakras. This is another one that balances all of your chakras. It's good for overcoming negativity, cleansing and purification, connection to higher dimensions and planes of existence. Uh, it helps facilitate communication with spirits, and it's a stone of transformation and personal growth. Lots and lots of personal growth and emotional healing. So the name Fire and Ice Quartz, it comes from how the quartz is made. It's the design inside is made by wrapping rapid heating and then very rapid cooling off. Some is naturally made this way, uh, just with the temperatures of the earth and some of it is man-made. Either way, the inside of this really, really neat quartz is filled with cracks that form rainbow mirrors that sparkle and shine in all different lights. It's it's honestly so pretty. It's like a prism, but kind of chaotic. <laughs> it doesn't have that obvious geometric, very structured look to it. It's, it's all over the place. Every piece you find is different, but honestly, they're all beautiful. I'd never seen this stone before. And then when I walked into my local crystal shop, into White Feather, there it was. I went right to it, couldn't stop looking at it. And the first one I picked up, it's like I'm still looking at it. I haven't been able to stop looking at it. It's captivating, just absolutely captivating. It makes me feel very, very focused during meditation, especially since I got it. It's helped me meditate because I focus so much on this stone, on this crystal. I'm seeing these rainbows and next thing you know, I'm just like, I'm off in a different place. It's awesome, awesome. So this piece of, piece of quartz mirrors a lot of the same energy of the lilac, which is of course why I picked it. Uh, like balancing and opening all your chakras, uh, cleansing your aura and energetic field, connecting you to spirit and other worlds, and it clears negativity. It's also incredibly healing. Uh, if you're someone who is into angels, archangels, it's usually associated with Archangel Raphael, which is the angel of healing. I'm not into angels, but it said that in almost everything I looked at and I figured that was kind of important. So if you are into angels, you should really check out this fire and ice quartz. Um, the stone works with all of your chakras, but it's especially powerful for opening up and connecting those upper chakras. You know, they're really cool, celestial, spiritual chakras, a lot like the lilac. It helps your crown, uh, your soul star and your stargate, which are two different chakras that are above your head. And yes, it's stargate. I like the show, makes me laugh every time. Uh, and it helps form a bridge between this world and you and other planes of existence. So it helps you receive messages and energy from spirit or from magical sources more easily. And it helps you access energy like your Akashic Records. This stone is really, really neat when you hold it. It has a lot of energy when you hold it, so much that it can be a little bit intense. This is not a stone, despite the fact that it's a little bit small. I don't take it anywhere. I don't put it in my pocket. I don't bring it places. I leave it at home in a very brightly lit place where I can always look at it. I bring it to my altar when I'm meditating or manifesting or spell casting. And I love to hold it and just right up to my face and look at all these different uh, rainbows. And it's like I can feel this tug. <laughs> like I can feel a little cord from each chakra just like tugging me into place. It's really, really nice. It makes me feel really cleansed and balanced at the end of a long day. It's also a stone of transformation and profound growth. It's a very mystical kind of stone. So if you're looking to make some real changes in your life, you might find that this stone makes that work just a little bit easier for you. It helps you receive and interpret messages from spirit or magic or intuition, uh, you know, spirit guides, ghosts, divinations, whatever, so that you can do the emotional and spiritual work needed. It also helps keep, you know, 
negativity and any sort of spirits that might take advantage of you or feelings that might take advantage of your less than balanced state so that, you know, you have room to breathe. Cool, eh? <laughs> so I, I picked both of these because they are working with your chakras and they're also fire and ice quartz. Um, like I said, I had never seen it before, but I've looked it up and it actually is quite popular, especially if you are American. It's a little bit more popular in American crystal shops, I guess, than it is here. So check out some fire and ice quartz and sneak over to your neighbor's yard you, and maybe go to like the alley entrance in the back so that you're not taking something they look at and cut down a little bit of lilac and try clearing out or accessing some of your chakras later today. If you don't like these or you can't find them, there are other sketchy herbs and magic rocks that work with your chakras. You can try lotus incense, uh, rose water or fresh roses, amethyst and obsidian. Uh, rose is said to have the highest vibration of any living thing on earth and is amazing for cleansing and clearing and love, of course. Uh, amethyst is the best healer and is excellent for clearing negativity and blocks while opening us up to spirituality. It also helps with things like sleep and calm. Obsidian cleanses your auric field and everything and can help with balance and can help with uh, grounding. It's, it's a little bit less, it's a little bit less mystical than the amethyst and a little bit more earthy. So it still really works. Of course, you can find all of this info, like I said, right on my blog. And if you use any crystals or flowers or herbs or oils to work with your chakras, I'd love to hear about it. What flowers or herbs do you think resonate there? How do you incorporate chakras into your witchcraft practice? I'd love to hear about it. You can find me all across social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram by searching Fat Feminist Wit. If you are interested in joining the book club and the private membership group, The Witch and Bitch, you can head to patreon.com slash the Fat Feminist Witch and you can join there. It's $10 a month. You get access to our Facebook group where you get to talk to other like-minded witches and magical practitioners. Every month we study a book, a uh, sketchy herb and a magic rock, and we usually talk about Sabbaths or moons or special days. I'm also working in a lot more tarot because that's something that I'm trying to get back into more divinations. So if you're interested, I would love to check that out. All the money goes towards supporting the blog, the podcast, and of course me. Because, <laughs> you know, if I don't eat or pay my rent, there's no blog or podcast. Sorry, y'all. So <laughs> check it out on Patreon. And thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, all about our chakra system. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your magical May afternoon, beautiful spring. And I hope you all get out there and uh, <laughs> stick your face in a lilac bush and connect so to some magical worlds. They're everywhere.